Hi, I'm Chris Toich, Forge Extension Specialist at the University of Kentucky's Research and Education Center located in Princeton. And I'm going to be talking about approaches to managing nutrient distributions within forage systems. First thing I want to talk about is nutrient cycling in pastures. Um, one of the beautiful things about well-managed grazing systems is that they're very sustainable in terms of nutrient inputs. We have a very strong nutrient cycle within well-managed grazing systems. We have inputs in the form of things like fertilizer, manure, legumes, feed, mineral supplements, anything that comes into the pasture enters into the nutrient cycle. And then they're cycled through the animal and the animal will recycle somewhere between 80 and 90% of the nutrient. And then exports in this system include our primary production in a cow-calf system that would be calves. And if we look at the amount of nutrients exported in a cow-calf pair in one year, and this is some data from the University of Missouri, we see that they take away about 10 pounds of nitrogen, about 7 pounds of P2O5 or phosphate, and about 1 pound of potassium oxide. And that's a very small quantity of nutrients removed from this well-managed grazing system. Now, what can happen in a grazing system is that we get a redistribution of nutrients within that system. So if I have animals and they're out here and they're grazing in this portion of the pasture and they come back to water and to shade and they lay down and ruminate and um, when they get back up they usually make a deposit and what they do is they defecate and they urinate and over time nutrients are transported from areas of the pasture that are further away and concentrated in areas of the pasture where animals congregate at. So that could be shade sources, water sources, uh, areas where you may feed hay at, areas where they may get a mineral supplement at. So where those animals congregate at, they tend to concentrate nutrient sources and over time will actually cause a redistribution of nutrients to these uh, aids, areas of shade and water within the pasture. So the question is, is what do we do about that? Probably the best thing we can do is implement some form of rotational stocking. So if we take this one big pasture boundary and we subdivide it into eight units as we have done here, provide water in each one of these subunits or paddocks, we can put the animals in here that have access to water, they can graze and then they can deposit those nutrients back into this paddock. So one of the big benefits of rotational stocking that we never talk about is its impact on nutrient distribution. We have much better nutrient distribution where we have a rotationally grazed pasture versus one large continuously grazed paddock. So this is some data from the University of Missouri and, and it's kind of interesting. This is adapted from the Missouri Grazing Manual. If we look at rotation frequency and then the years to deposit one dung paddy per square foot and I kind of feel bad for the graduate student that had to do this research. We find in a continuous system it would take 27 years to get one dung paddy per square yard. Now in a very intensively managed system, so this would be like a dairy grazing system where we're moving every one or two days, it's going to be as little as two years to get that one dung pile per square yard. The, the point that I want to make here is not that everybody should be rotating every two days, but as we start to intensify management, subdivide pastures, and rotationally stock those pastures, we're going to improve the distribution of dung and urine within those pastures. And that's important to remember. And we're going to be down here somewhere about one to two moves per week, somewhere in here. And it's going to take four to five years to get that pasture covered with one dung pile per square yard. And this is kind of showing something similar here. If we look at the diagram on the right, we have one paddock, a three-day rotation. We can see the density of dung piles. So as, a, as the um, shade of gray gets darker, we have a higher density of dung piles. So where we have one paddock of a 24 pasture rotation, so this is a three pasture rotation on top, a 24 pasture rotation, we have a much denser deposition of dung piles uh, per 500 square feet. And, and that's the beauty of, of subdividing pastures into smaller units is we get a much more uniform 
uh, distribution of dung and urine in those pastures. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about nutrient removal in hay, and, and you'll kind of see how this kind of fits into this whole discussion on nutrient distribution in pastures in a minute. Um, and this is adapted from southern forages. And what I want you to notice, if you look at something like tall fescue, we're going to have about 40 pounds of nitrogen per ton of hay, about 20 pounds of P2O5, and about 50 pounds of K2O per ton of hay. And it varies a little bit between forage crops and so forth. But, but those are some good rough estimates on nutrient removal by hay. Why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this for a couple reasons. Number one, I want you to realize that if you're making hay, you're going to have to replace those nutrients. And we can remove a tremendous amount of nutrients when we make hay off of the field. Um, are we going to deplete the soil in a year? No, but if we keep doing it year after year and we don't replenish those nutrients, we're going to eventually draw those fertility levels down in that particular hay meadow. So if we look at something like, uh, say, orchard grass, and we have a good year, and we produce three tons of, of hay per acre, that's a removal of 150 pounds of nitrogen, about 45 pounds of P2O5, and around 180 pounds of K2O. And we can do that for a year or two and, and not have any huge effect on yield. But over time, we're going to draw those nutrient levels down. And um, we'll see uh, yield decrease as fertility decreases in that pasture. The point is, is you have to, you have to replace those nutrients to keep productivity up. Let's look at the nutrients in hay for a 40 cow herd. So say I've got 40 brood cows. So we've got to make a few assumptions to do these calculations. We're going to say each brew cow during the hay feeding season can eat 30 pounds of hay a day. Pretty reasonable estimation, I would say. This is the nutrient content of that hay. 40 pounds of nitrogen, 15 pounds of P2O5, and 50 pounds of potash. We're going to feed hay for 120 days. Some, some farms will be shorter, some years will be shorter, and some will be considerably longer. Uh, the average hay feeding time is, is probably going to be around 150 days on most farms. So we're doing a little bit better than average here. These are the cost of the nutrients, and I just got these from the co-op uh, last week. 54 cents for nitrogen, 49 cents for a pound of P2O5, and 34 cents for a, a pound of K2O. This is the amount of hay that we're going to feed. Um, for 40 cows, so we take 40 cows times 30 pounds a day times 120 days is, is 144,000 pounds or 72 tons of hay we'll need for that 120 day hay feeding period. You always want to have a little bit more hay than this um, in case our period stretches from 120 to 150 or so on. Or we get into a drought and need some extra hay. So we'll say 72 tons is the amount of hay that we're going to feed for 120 days. So let's do the math real quick. The first thing I want to calculate is the amount of nutrients. So all we do is take the, the tons of hay and multiply it by that particular nutrient, the pounds of that nutrient in each ton. For example, nitrogen, 72 times 40 pounds of nitrogen per ton is 2,880 pounds of nitrogen. We do the same thing for phosphorus and, and for potash. The point that I want to make here is that we're bringing a tremendous amount of nutrients into this system by feeding that hay. So each, that 72 tons of hay is, is going to have somewhere around seven to 8,000 pounds of nutrients. Now, we won't recover all those nutrients, and depending on how we feed that hay, we're going to either realize more or less value from those nutrients, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. So if we look at the value of those nutrients at current prices, these are the, the current values for the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. We add that up, we're looking at somewhere around $3,300 worth of nutrients in that hay. So if we're buying hay and bringing it into our system, we not only get the feed value for that hay, but we also get kind of get a coupon for those nutrients. And in this case, for that 72 tons of hay, we're getting around $3,300 worth of nutrients. And again, we won't realize that complete number, but depending on how we manage it, we'll realize some of that, how we manage that hay feeding. 
All right, so we've got our same pasture here, and we decided we're going to feed our hay. And we're going to feed it over here close to the road because it's easy to get to. We just dump a couple bales out uh, two or three times a week for these for these animals. And um, essentially what we're doing is we're taking all those nutrients at 8,000 pounds or that $3,000 worth of nutrients and we're putting it on one paddock. Would, would you ever do that with fertilizers? One of the questions. Really, to get the best value out of this nutrients, we need to spread it over the entire pasture area instead of concentrating all those nutrients in one area. This is commonly what happens in, in uh, pastures in, in Virginia and other transition zone states. A better choice would be is if we could move those feeding points around. And, and there's different approaches to doing this. We could actually just set hay out in different paddocks as, as we're feeding it in the winter months. Anything that we can do to spread that, those feeding points out is going to be ideal. Or we could implement something like bale grazing. And, and bale grazing is when we simply set hay out in, in late fall or early winter when it's still dry, and then we limit a access to that hay using a temporary fence. So we could actually take a piece of poly wire and give them two bales at a time, and then move it and give them another two or three bales at a time. And as we move through each one of these paddocks doing that, we're going to get a much more uniform distribution of nutrients in those paddocks. Um, Greg Halleck has been doing some demonstrations and, and uh, using bale grazing on his own farm. And he produced a really nice video um, that features bale grazing and talks about its benefits and, and challenges and opportunities. And that's available on the Virginia Forage and Grassland Council YouTube site. Just Google VFGC YouTube and you can go ahead and watch that video. And I will say that there's a, a lot of data on bale grazing, but it's more from the arid portions of the United States rather than from uh, the humid areas where we are. We have some specific challenges in humid areas with uh, pugging up pastures during the winter months if we get our bale density too high. All right, I want to talk a little bit about using hay as a tool for managing nutrient flows within a farm. So this is just an example of a farm, and, and this would say maybe this was an old dairy farm. Um, so w where do we have the highest nutrient concentrations on a farm? And, and generally it's in proximity to livestock. So if this was an old dairy and this was our milking platform here, our highest nutrient concentrations are going to be on this portion of the farm. Um, because it's easy to spread manure there, maybe the animals get some access to, to some of the pastures or hay fields here or uh, fields during the winter months. But we're going to tend to concentrate nutrients close to where the animal concentration are, are on that farm. Where's going to be the lowest nutrient concentrations? Well, the, the fields that are hardest to get to, right? So that's going to be on the back side of the farm. Uh, so we'll have a kind of a nutrient gradient on this farm. So how do we capture the value of these high nutrient concentrations? Well, we can actually produce hay on these areas and then feed the hay where we have nutrient concentrations that are low on the farm. And over time, we can transform nutrients. One thing I want to stress um, during this talk is that, that Moving hay around and feeding hay is a good way to bring nutrients into a grazing system or move nutrients around on a farm, but it's not the same as putting commercial fertilizer down. If I have a really low nutrient status in my pastures and I need those pastures to be productive, then I'm still better off to purchase some commercial fertilizer and get those nutrient levels up into that medium soil test range. So the point with this slide is that we can use hay as a tool for transferring nutrient concentrations onto a farm and even within the farm moving nutrients from high to low areas of concentration. So the take-home points I want you to remember today is one, rotational stocking improves nutrient distribution in grazing systems. Two, hay contains significant quantities of nutrients. Three, hay can be used to manage nutrient flows and grazing systems. So we can bring nutrients onto farms by purchasing hay and, and feeding that hay on our farm. 
or we can move hay around with or uh, move nutrients around within our grazing system using hay also. Absolutely critical to remember if we're going to use hay, it, how we feed that hay out impacts the value of those nutrients. So if I feed them all in one paddock, then those nutrients are doing very little good for me within my grazing system. If I can spread those feeding points out, then they're going to be of much greater value. And the last thing I'll just mention is that if you've got poor fields or poor pastures on your farm, then, then that's, that's the place you should really be feeding hay during the winter months um, because that's going to allow that organic matter from the hay and those nutrients in the hay to improve that poor pasture. And it's not the same as spreading fertilizer, but over time you're going to build nutrients up within that, that pasture or hay field uh, where they tend to be lower. All right. I'm always available for questions. I can be reached at my email below or, or on the cell phone. And, and I always encourage people, your first route of contact should be your local extension agent. So this is Matea Mitchell in, in Virginia, I mean in Kentucky, but your local agent in Virginia is a great resource. They know your farm, they know your landscape, they know your county and your limitations, and they can help you um, with your question. And they know who to go to if if it's beyond their level of expertise. So thanks for taking the time to listen to this video. If you have any questions, uh, please contact your local extension agent um, or you can give me a call.